Hi, Tom. Hi, Peter. How are you today? I'm good. Tom is the Chief Executive Officer with iMinerals. And Tom, I have to admit, I didn't know much about your company before doing some research, and I'm really impressed. Well, thanks. It's, it's quite a different play. This is, you know, most unlike conventional mining in that we have four unique industrial minerals which are used in everyday life. And so people are familiar with them, but they, they don't really recognize it because they're in products that you use every day but don't really know, uh, you know, what the minerals go into. Right. I see your main product is quartz. So other than my bathroom countertop, what do I use quartz for in my everyday life? Well, there's quartz and there's quartz. You know, it's one of the most ubiquitous minerals on earth that it sells from about $25 a ton to 20000 depending on the application. Hey, so, and so, so ours is, Where does it trade? Is there like a London Metals Exchange? No, there, it does not trade. Okay, this is highly secretive and everything goes under contract. The largest company is Sabelco Uniman. Oh, okay. And they have pretty much a monopoly on the very high-end, you know, $1,000 plus type quartz, which goes into computer applications. So like the screen we're looking at, like on my iPad, is high-end quartz. All these other chips come out of that. Um, or you can use it for mundane things like making regular float glass or golf course sand or kids' sandboxes. And so these things, so they trade over a very wide range. But every member we have here is not LEM trade. Yeah. And so the, the, the pricing, particularly for the quartz, is quite opaque. So it's a lot like graphite in some forms of manganese. They trade off in exchange. That, that's great, yeah. And so we, we have case fire, again, which is not exchange trade. We have Hloysite, which is very high value clay, which is you know quite novel and unique. Uh, and then we've got Medicaid, which is another clay product. And again, that goes in the cement industry. And so some of those, you know, you have a little bit better understanding of price, but I'll say all this stuff is, is very, very opaque. Right. And where is this, what do you call this deposit and where is it located? Well, it's, it's the Bowville Kaolin deposit, but it's up out of a little town called Bowville, which is about 30 miles or so due east of Moscow and Idaho. Right. And how, how far is that from uh, Boise, right? Yeah, Boise would be a couple hundred miles to the south, and it's about 110 miles due south of Spokane. Are you um, up in the mountains or out into the flats? Uh, it's quasi-mountains. It's kind of hilly. It's up about 2,000 feet or so, so it's not true mountains. Okay, so to the best of my recollection, the largest quartz deposit in the world is in Poland. Are you anything like that deposit? No, this is a very unique uh, deposit. So we have four minerals, but like I said, there's quartz and there's quartz. And so if you look at like U.S. Silica and some of the large guys here who make fracking sands or make, you know, say lower end quartz for plate glass, this is a more high end quartz uh, for more specialty type applications. So it's really for like LED lighting and, and solar glass and like computer screens and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a much higher quality product. So it must be high silica content or silicon. It's high silica, but there's actually several criteria. You don't want deleterious elements, and so it has very low iron and very low other minerals. And there's also the sizing of it, and there's also the fluidity of what really what the viscosity is. And so actually quartz has quite a few specifications. These are minerals, not elements. Right, so, it's, so they have chemistries. There are parallels to the graphite industry. Correct, yes. Okay. Uh, what stage of the permitting are you at? Well, the permitting, we expect the final permitting here in about the next two weeks or so. You got to, everything. You just got water, right? Uh, well, we've got the water permit, and, and, and we have a land use permit with the state of Idaho, and so we've been working with them for about the last year. We put in the final information and things that they want, and so we expect that sometime in early May. And then we'll be basically ready to go, ready to build. Right, so you must have a feasibility study. The feasibility study was completed about a year ago, and that shows you know, very robust uh, economics. Um, I was just off in Europe, and, and we we're talking to you know several different uh, you know investors and things. But also one of our, our, our experts, we have a Hawaii site expert, has a lot more uses and things for the Hawaii site. So really, the economics keep improving, and so this is a unique property. And if you look at from the preliminary economic assessment, pre fees, fees to today, the numbers have been getting better and better. And really, that comes down to marketing. There's a lot more uses for these materials, um, and as you look into these markets. Um, particularly, say, say for something like quartz, if you just do a little bit of grinding on it, you can put it into paints and things like that, and that adds a lot more value um, to it. And, and so it's quite unlike conventional you know, mining, where typically the numbers go the other, other direction. Any idea what the global market for quartz is annually? Well, the market in North America is about a million tons per annum of, of high-value quartz. And so there's you know many, many millions of tons, but these products really don't transport well. And that typically they go out bulk, they go out in 100-ton rail cars, or they go out in bulk right. bags. And so really you're looking at the marketing 
you know, close to where the mine is. And so the only real transportable product is the Hawaii site. Because that sells for thousands of dollars a ton, um, you know, that can be shipped in smaller quantities. And right now, the big market of that is in Germany. On the feasibility must show a normalized run rate on those uh, elements. Assuming full production capacity, what's your margin? Well, the margin is about 70%. Um, this is very unlike, you know, conventional mining, where in a gold mine you're moving hundreds of millions of tons to make a small nugget. Here, 70% of what you mine is sold as product, and the other 30% is actually off-spec product. So it is going into tailings, but we're currently selling the tailings that were left behind from the historical mining area into the cement industry. So really, everything you produce almost can be sold in, in, in some some fashion. So there's surface rock. It's like aggregate used for construction. No, it's actually like sand and clay. I mean, there's no drilling or blasting. The stuff's all on near surface. It looks like a white powdery sand. And all you do then is you, you just kind of scoop it up. And again, there's not conventional mining equipment. You're using really 10 cubic meter trucks like you see over the road, you know, back hose and stuff or, or, or front end loader. And you scoop it up and put it in the plant and you wash it. That takes the clay off for processing. And then the sand left behind, you go through several differential sets of flotation and you make your case bar and coarse products then. What's your projected life of mine? Well, right now we have a 25-year SEC quality reserve, but we have indicated out past 100 years. And so, well, I guess we're going to probably tend to be very, very long life. And so Emery's, which is a very large French concern around the CAC, um, they had a case fire mine in Georgia here, and they shut it down after 57 years. And, and so these things tend to go forever and ever and ever. So what's the next thing that investors should be looking for? Well, I think the next thing is we'll be getting our permits here in the next few weeks, and I think that's really the catalyst then to propel things forward. So if you look at our stock chart, we've more than doubled um, this year. We've been doing quite a few roadshows and have a lot of people that are interested in this that, that, that understand um, industrial minerals. So we'll be looking, once we have the permits, to raise capital in earnest, which will probably start about September or so. So again, very, very inexpensive relative to mine. It's about $108 million uh, to actually fund the full CapEx. There's really very little sustaining CapEx. Um, and so we'll be looking to, to, to raise that money and, and, and get a short time to build this because there's no heavy foundations, crushing, grinding, things of that nature. It's about a 9 to 12 month engineering and then about a 9 to 12 month construction. So we're hoping then to be uh, up, up and running here by summer of 2019. Fantastic. Can we check in again with you in a couple of months, see how we're doing? Yeah, positively. I say in the next few weeks, once we have our permits, I think when that announcement comes out, we'll be moving forward to, at, at light speed to get this up and running. There's a huge demand for these. Right now, there's no domestic case fire production. The Hawaii site has, has a lot of high-end pharmaceutical and medical applications. In fact, several press releases um, from Germany is this stuff is being used for diabetic wound care, highly successful. It can also be used for other types of wound care, um, functional fillers, uh, gas filtration, many things. But it, it really looks exciting as to where we're going in this. Great. Look forward to chatting with you in a couple of months. Thanks for your time. No, thank you, Peter. Bye.